welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about the basics, one aspect, one basic of Kundalini Yoga, uh, which is mantra. So before you click away, because it's currently news, maybe a scary word for you. <laughs> My intention to even be on YouTube is to bridge the gap between the Eastern and Western philosophy, sort of bust through some of the fears to see that this practice is something that all people should do to self-heal their bodies. The more I dive into it, the more I find that there's so much similarity uh, across the globe. And um, most cultures have a prayer meditation, sound, practice. So if we look at the Kundalini practice of chanting mantras or breath work or anything, and we strip everything down to just the physiology, so just what the body's doing, without any projections or ideas of what that could mean that people have placed on what the body's doing, based on your heritage or perceptions or whatever. So we just look at the physiology of chanting a mantra. That's where I think we can really universally come together on this as a great idea. And then once we get past that little hurdle, then it's really beautiful to explore all of the various ancient teachings and just seeing how everyone painted such a beautiful picture all reflecting you know, all that is and trying to understand this human experience. Okay, so mantra is basically energy encased in a sound structure. Just like how a song is coming to you on, over your radio, it was once an idea, right? It was once floating in some artist's mind and it was brought down and it was given structure, it was given form. That sound was recorded to a, you know, very measured system. And it was usually co-collaborative community experience to make that one song come to you over your radio. That's kind of how mantras are. So over time, with the good intentions of encasing these sound vibrations with healing, because many that have come before us have charged these sacred sounds. And those that discovered these sacred sounds Mind you, think of the context of how they experienced their lives. So they didn't have all of the interference that we have today, like the phone that I'm talking to. At one point, you can have 200 calls and you're coming through your body because there's cell towers around, you know, and it's not to say that, you know, you have to drop out of society to practice Kundalini, but we do have to spend even more time, I'd say, than the ancients did to cleanse and clarify our bodies because that is the distilling process of self-healing, getting rid of toxins, whether they're the food we're eating or what we're perceiving, what we're, the people we're hanging out with. There's so many forms of things that can be a, a vibrational encasement that is not healthy. So the mantras are a healthy encasement of energy that brings protection, healing, um, abundance, even money. And so that's something that everybody can benefit from, but we have to charge through the conditioning and fear if you're like me and grew up in a space where our grandmas didn't teach us mantras maybe you learned prayer like i did here's a really interesting fact about prayer so i'll go into this on in another episode so let me know if you want to hear it sooner rather than later but unpopular opinion what we actually need more of is carbon dioxide not necessarily oxygen what i mean by that is when we're breathing and we're practicing our yoga you've probably heard to slow down your breath. Even when you're exerting at force on your body, try to slow down, stay connected, feel your spine, be centered. So now that we have this beautiful science that can measure stuff, are we finding out just how accurate the yogis are? Because what happens in your, when your respiratory system, your cardiovascular system, your endocrine system, the goal of yoga is to line all these systems up 
and most of them are, you know, obviously all of them actually are connected to the health of your spine. The lungs, however, how they relate to carbon dioxide and oxygen is you inhale that oxygen, takes a ride through the body, um, but it's actually the carbon dioxide that's doing the releasing and it's sort of like the toxic waste vehicle. So there was studies done in this beautiful book called Breath by James Nestor. And he was working with also science and yogis and trying to figure this all out. They were doing testing on cyclists or many, many sports, these many case studies where this was happening, but measuring the oxygen levels in your body, it would stay the same whether you're going slow or if you're exerting a lot of pressure and breathing fast. So he argues the points that health ailments are due to breathing too much oxygen and not fully breathing, expanding your lungs. And why it's important to expand your lungs is because now we're working with our posture, our muscular system, our <laughs> skeletal system. So your spine is the center channel. So when we get into Kundalini, and they weren't necessarily cutting people open and seeing the physical spine, they were feeling it all. They weren't necessarily looking from the outside of the body inside like we are able to now because we can measure things and look at light spectrums and EMFs or like we can measure the changes in the body like with computers. <laughs> but they're coming from a perspective of feeling everything. And that connection, that ability to feel so sensitively is now to our benefit. It was passed down orally, tradition from what people would have been studying even in Christianity. So the Christian mystics will be doing the same things that the yogis of India might have been practicing. So that's prayer and meditation. So not to fear something that we don't understand. Because Kundalini also, especially with mantras, is born from the seed of in the beginning was the word. How the cosmos was created, energy, everything was sound. The first thing ever was sound, which makes sense because what is sound but waves and frequency traveling. <laughs> so a mantra is repeating a sound a sound that has been charged with whatever its specific intention was. So again, you get to exercise your free will. You don't have to say anything that you don't want to say. It might be in a different language, but there's translations. And what's so beautiful about the Sanskrit language too is that it's so intentional. It's poetry, it's so thought out. It even connects you to the stars. In ancient Christianity, they had, so Kabbalism, their words and symbols, if you've ever read like a uh, Jewish, old Jewish text, there's like no vowels, it's like kind of hard to pronounce. That is because all the letters are mathematical equations. So their alphabet connects on another dimension of like sacred geometry. Here in India, we have this other beautiful key to the beautiful symphony of all of these different myths and legends unraveling um, they connect the language to sound and vibration. Not to say that there's not crossover, but we get these two beautiful focuses and we can put it all together and that's pretty awesome. We're going to do one sound mantra, Har. And Har connects you to creative infinity. So whatever creative infinity looks like to you, based off of maybe what you were raised with or whatever. Feel free to insert that power. What makes you feel connected to being peaceful and holy? Paint your picture. Envision that. And you're gonna line up your spine. And the har is sort of a rolling R to it. So you're not going to close your mouth in between saying it. Keep a space, relax your face, relax your jaw. Keep the mouth open, just gently. And the tapping of the tongue on the roof of the mouth is doing a lot, but is stimulating glands that are going to 
release into your body what is going to cleanse, clear, and heal. So how the yogis would maybe say that is cleansing your org field. In the West, they might say you're tapping the roof of your mouth to stimulate your pituitary gland. So however you want to look at it, join me. <laughs> and we're going to do it in a sea of sound. So I'll play music and we'll just repeat that sound. You're bringing your navel in, squeezing here, charging up so your space, spine is nice and strong, nice and straight. So hear that a rolling sound. And so the goal is to get lost in that and grounded. So feel your feet. And whenever you're ready, join. Inhale, hold at the top, apply your locks if you know. And exhale. So this is what it feels like to have more carbon dioxide in the body through chanting, you're exhaling, you're releasing air, you're sending toxins out of your body. Your mind has something to focus on because it's hearing a sound. You can hear the vibration and it can help you line up your bones because you can feel it in your body, it's pulling into your navel, shh, shh, extending your spine tall. And now the body can function more easily. And the body is functioning more easily. You're more able to be a vessel for that creation energy. So perhaps some of these old books and old ways had some beautiful truths that we can bring to modern times. Imagine if everybody knew that they could heal themselves. So to end this practice, take three deep breaths together. Imagine you're breathing in light and exhaling. As you exhale, it brings and sends protection out. Inhaling again, inhaling love. And as you exhale, 
We send out forgiveness as we inhale again. Breathe in vitality. Exhale any toxins, mind, body, soul. Thank you for practicing with me. Namaste, Satnam.